aún en tiempos difíciles, sigue adelante. Continúa preparándote. Para los que creen en el futuro, Universidad Nacional Pedro Enrique Sureña. En las escuelas de arquitectura hay fantasmas ¿okay? que poseen a los estudiantes. Al menos los que logran pasar el segundo o tercer periodo, indefectiblemente caen. Yo no explico de otra manera la devoción compromiso que asumen los estudiantes de arquitectura en una carrera como esta. La posición ocurre en el taller. El taller es el espacio donde se da eso. El lugar que se va convirtiendo en tu espacio total, en tu, en tu hábitat total. ¿No? Ocurre por contagio, como los virus. Sin embargo, no se transmite fuera del, del aula. Es como si estuviera el fantasma estuviera confinado dentro del aula, dentro del taller de arquitectura. ¿Es dañino? Mira, no sé. ¿Tiene cura? No. Definitivamente no. Si te tocó, nada va a volver a ser como antes. Para ti no tiene sentido juntarse con la misma gente, hacer lo mismo y a contar los mismos chistes. Deja de tener sentido. Las parejas son las primeras que lo sienten. Y a veces no le vale ni siquiera quedarse contigo cortando palito la tarde entera. Hay un día que ellos te ponen a brillar. Te hacen sentir invencible. Viene con el gesto de un profesor que te dice algo sobre algo que hiciste bien o algo así. O con una buena nota que tú no esperabas sacar y que nadie más sacó. Ese día tú explotas de alegría y dura hasta la próxima vez. Añoro tropezarme con esos objetos en el aula, en el pasillo feos, bonitos, interesantes, sorprendentes, asombrosos. Y me angustia que todo esto está acabando con el fantasma de la escuela. Si no tienes piernas, corre. Si no tienes palabras, escribe poesía. Si no puedes salir, imagina. Ciencia y Tecnología, Dr. Francis García Pérez.
en la UNCU, tiene usted un aliado decidido que pone a su disposición todo nuestro historial académico, la experiencia de nuestro plan profesional y los recursos humanos y materiales de los que disponemos para que juntos podamos lograr nuestras metas más importantes de bienestar y progreso basadas en la educación integral de nuestro país. Good afternoon and welcome to Baptist Health International's monthly medical lecture. I would like to extend warm greetings to our returning friends across Latin America and the Caribbean. This afternoon, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Juan Viles Gonzalez, who is the medical director of Arrhythmia Management at Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute. His presentation will be Arrhythmias 101. Dr. Billis Gonzalez is a cardiac electrophysiologist and director of arrhythmia management, ambulatory, and cardiology at Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute, which is part of Baptist Health South Florida. Dr. Billis Gonzalez is triple board certified in internal medicine, cardiovascular medicine, and cardiac electrophysiology. And he specializes in prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of complex cardiac arrhythmias and its risk, and its risk factors. He has distinctive training and expertise in cardiac electrophysiology, making him uniquely qualified to assess and diagnose the heart's electrical system activity and treat abnormal heartbeats or arrhythmias. Dr. Vilas Gonzalez earned his medical degree at the University of Buenos Aires in Buenos Aires, Argentina. He completed his, inter his internship and in residency in internal medicine at Brainman and uh, Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. He also completed a cardio cardiology fellowship as well as a cardiac electrophysiology fellowship at Monsanto Hospital, Monsanto School of New York, New York. Prior to joining Miami Cardiac Vascular Institute, he was director of cardiac electrophysiology at Tulane Medical Center in New Orleans, Louisiana. In addition, he was appointed professor of medicine at Wertheim College of Medicine, Florida International University. Dr. Vilas Gonzalez is a fellow of the American College of Cardiology, fellow of the American Heart Association, fellow of the Heart Rhythm Society, and a number, uh, and numerous other numbers of several professional associations. He conducts clinical research in his specialty to increase the efficacy and efficiency of treatments and improve patient outcomes. He's widely published in peer-reviewed scientific journals and textbooks, and is an invited speaker at national and international cardiology conferences. Dr. Vilas Gonzalez serves on the editorial board of the Journal of the American College of Cardiology and Heart Rhythm Journal Case Report, and as a reviewer for several other medical publications. Dr. Vilas Gonzalez, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Welcome and best of luck in the presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hakim, for such a nice introduction. Uh, I want to welcome everybody. I want to thank Baptist International for putting this excellent program together. I'm going to start sharing my screen so we can get this lecture started. So I have the almost impossible task uh, to talk about 
tachyarrhythmias and try and cover the most important concepts of this huge chapter in the world of cardiovascular medicine. I'm gonna start with the objectives of the lecture. We wanna define what SVTs or supraventricular tachycardias are, understand the general approach to treat the most common supraventricular arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation. I want you to learn also to uh, identify the, the individual stroke risk in different patients with SVTs. I want you to understand and learn the anatomic and physiologic basis for SVT, the anatomic and physiologic basis as well for VT or ventricular tachycardia, and distinguish between ventricular tachycardia in structurally normal hearts and in patients that have a different substrate or cardiomyopathy. This is the outline. We'll start talking about atrial fibrillation, then atrial flutter, then AV nodal reentry or AVNRT, then AV reciprocating tachycardia or AVRT. Those are the SVTs that are dependent on an accessory pathway or WPW. Then lastly, we'll talk about atrial tachycardia. And the last section, I'll talk briefly about ventricular tachycardia in patients with cardiomyopathy, in patients with normal hearts, and in patients with genetic syndromes. I will start with atrial fibrillation, which constitutes nowadays an epidemic. In the United States, it's estimated that there are 16 million people, uh, uh, 12 million people currently, and 16 million people will have atrial fibrillation by 2050. Uh, the prevalence of atrial fibrillation is around 1% in the general population, but this prevalence goes up all the way to 10% in the elderly, in those that are older than 80 years old. One of the main problems with patients with atrial fibrillation is that they have an increased risk of stroke, heart failure, cognitive dysfunction, and as well as an increase in mortality. So clearly have a different survival than the rest of the population. 15% of all strokes in the United States and more than 30% in those patients that are older than 80 occur because patients have a substrate with atrial fibrillation. In patients with asymptomatic embolic events, that is patients with atrial fibrillation that don't know that they have atrial fibrillation but form clots inside the heart and these clots move to their brain, long-term they will have significant cognitive dysfunction. 30% of the patients with atrial fibrillation actually have no symptoms and this arrhythmia is discovered as an incidental finding during a doctor's office visit or when we check the function of their pacemakers or the fibrillators. As you can see in this old epidemiologic study published almost 20 years ago in JAMA, the prevalence both in men and in women uh, significantly increases and is intimately related to the age of the population study. You can see here uh, in the horizontal axis that the older the population that we study, the higher the prevalence of atrial fibrillation. There's a slight predominance in men over women, but I don't want you to pay attention to that gender difference because what really matters is that as you get older and as you develop more risk factors, you have more atrial fibrillation. Just to talk briefly about the definitions, we like to use uh, these following terms to try and distinguish patients that have different durations of atrial fibrillation. We call paroxysmal or intermittent atrial fibrillation those patients that have episodes of this arrhythmia that last less than 48 hours. In the U.S. we like to use, this is from the European guidelines, but they, in the U.S. we like to use a cutoff of less than seven days. And that brings us to the next category, which are patients that have continuous atrial fibrillation or persistent atrial fibrillation. That's the term that we like to use. And these are patients that have atrial fibrillation for periods longer than seven days. 
when this duration is more than one year, we call it long-standing persistent. And when we abandon the effort to restore normal sinus rhythm in these patients, we call it permanent atrial fibrillation. These are just some basic definitions so we can talk the same language. When we discuss treatment goals in these patients with atrial fibrillation, essentially we have three. Prevention of stroke. Most patients will be candidates for anticoagulation and we'll talk some more about that. Control the rate. We want the patients to have a heart rate of less than 110 beats per minute or rhythm control. That would be the third strategy and that's the one we prefer in most patients to try and restore normal sinus rhythm. This is critically important in patients that have significant symptoms as well as in patients that have congested heart failure. And the most effective way to restore normal sinus rhythm is to do a procedure called catheter ablation by which we cauterize, we burn, and we electrically isolate the areas that are causing the arrhythmia. The drugs that we use, colantarrhythmics, are significantly less effective than catheter ablation are, are usually short-term solutions to the problem. The way we determine the way we determine the stroke risk in each patient is by using this scoring system called the CHAD score, which includes uh, two points for a prior stroke, two points for age older than 75, one point if you are older than 65, hypertension, diabetes, and the presence of congestive heart failure. This was modified a few years ago to include uh, uh, two, uh, three additional risk factors, including vascular disease, uh, gender, and giving an extra point for females, and giving one point as opposed to two in patients that have an age between 65 and 75. So it's really important that we document this, and we do that every time we see the patient in the office. And that will determine uh, the, strategy, the strategy that we use for stroke prevention. Essentially, we have from antiplatelets like aspirin and clopidogrel uh, to warfarin and the new oral anticoagulants, including the thrombin inhibitors and the factor 10A inhibitors. The big concept, the big concept is that aspirin is much more effective with a 19% relative risk reduction is much less effective than warfarin that has a 65% relative risk reduction. And most of the neural anticoagulants are non-inferior to warfarin and some of them like Eliquis showed uh, increased efficacy in redu reducing strokes when compared to warfarin. How do we decide? Well, we use the chats vas score. If your chats vas score is more than two and you are uh, a male, then you need anticoagulation with warfarin or one of the new oral anticoagulants. If you are a female and your chas score is three or more, then you also qualify for warfarin. So those are the class one indications for anticoagulation based on the current guidelines. The new oral anticoagulants, just two words on, on that because you're gonna see them uh, in many patients nowadays are the factor 10 inhibitors, rivaroxaban, apixaban, and edoxaban. The last one, betrixaban, is still undergoing investigation. And then the direct thrombin inhibitors, the one approved here uh, in the market is the bigatron. Now, in terms of how to decide between what to do about heart rate control versus rhythm control, I would urge you to always try to attempt to restore sinus rhythm unless you prove really that the patient is uh, completely asymptomatic. Many times the patient comes to the office with no clear symptoms. We found that the patient is in atrial fibrillation and we restore sinus rhythm by either giving an antiarrhythmic or doing a very simple non-invasive treatment called cardioversion by which we shock the patient back into normal rhythm. And then we discovered that this patient that initially was uh, labeled as asymptomatic was actually uh, 
uh, lacking energy, stamina, and other symptoms that were uh, sort of uh, covered by progressively adjusting their quality of life. So the, the notion that there's no difference in the treatment, in the treatment strategy that you pick came from a study called AFFIRM, this first uh, clinical trial that was published 20 years ago uh, and was followed by several follow-up studies. There's no difference in mortality. There's no difference in quality of life but this was challenged by several studies that were published later on, including that one that was presented at the European Society of Cardiology meeting two weeks ago, showing that uh, clearly in patients that you do early rhythm control, that means that as soon as you diagnose it, you, you restore sinus rhythm, those patients have improved cardiovascular outcomes, improved survival. So these data from 20 years ago that has been taught in medical schools based on the AFFIRM trial showing that there was no difference in quality of life of survival is now obsolete. And we have growing evidence that rhythm control, particularly early rhythm control, is the way to go. This is a study that I was alluding to, published in New England Journal on August 29, showing that if you do early rhythm control, in the blue uh, curve here on this Kaplan-Meier graph, you can see that the cumulative incidence of cardiovascular events is significantly better in early rhythm control versus usual care. So a really important concept that if you're gonna remember just one thing from this lecture, this is the one to remember. In patients with heart failure, there was another study published in New England Journal two years ago showing that in these patients, when you do ablation, the probability for survival or uh, hospital admissions is much better when you do a catheter ablation and you eliminate the arrhythmia than when, when you do conventional medical therapy to do heart rate control. So those are two big concepts which are relatively new uh, and I really want you to remember that. In terms of uh, rhythm control with medications, if we use antiarrhythmics, most of these medications have a prarrhythmic side effect. Uh, it does require chronic use uh, of these medications in order to maintain sinus rhythm. So we are exposing the patients long-term uh, to potential side effects. And the natural history of these patients and these drugs is that they eventually fail and we have to switch them to a different antiarrhythmic. Whereas in catheter ablation, you face the procedure-related complications up front as opposed to long-term, uh, but they are uh, fairly acceptable, accounting for 1% complications uh, in most centers worldwide. And it's now considered first-line therapy for patients with newly diagnosed atrial fibrillation. This is a graph that I, I'm not gonna spend time going through it, but I just wanted to make you aware that depending on the substrate and depending on the risk factors that the patient has, other comorbidities like coronary disease or hypertension or heart failure, there, there are different drugs that you can and you cannot use. And there's no reason for you to remember this because you can uh, Google it and look at the guidelines from the American Heart Association and you will find this graph in every guideline online. So there's no point for you to remember. One last word about catheter ablation. Randomized controlled trials have significantly, have shown that significantly better treat these patients when you compare catheter ablation versus antiarrhythmic drugs, okay? That's a big concept that we discuss today. Now, when I say catheter ablation, what do we do? Well, one important concept that I also want you to remember is that atrial fibrillation is an arrhythmia that arises from the left atrium, okay? The left atrium. In particularly from these little uh, tubes that you see here called the pulmonary veins, which drain oxygenated blood from the lungs into the left atrium. So there's an electrical short circuit in that area. And red, these red dots that you see in the figure 
are essentially the areas that we ablate in order for uh, the heart to be electrically isolated from the pulmonary veins. So if there's a short circuit here causing atrial fibrillation inside the veins, now after the ablation, it will not be able to reach the rest of the heart because those veins are electrically isolated. That would conclude the section on atrial fibrillation. And now I will talk about probably the second most common arrhythmia that we see in the hospital, in hospitalized patients, and that's called atrial flutter. So the big difference between atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation is that atrial flutter originates in the right atrium. We discussed that atrial fibrillation originates in the left atrium. Atrial fibrillation tends to be a very irregular arrhythmia, whereas flutter typically shows in the EKGs very regular QRSs. And then it shows these characteristic waves on the inferior leads, which we call F waves or flutter waves. And it has the shape of a sawtooth. So those are the classic findings of atrial flutter. One thing to keep in mind is that up to 50% of patients with atrial fibrillation will also have atrial flutter. So these arrhythmias, although they originate in different areas of the heart, they also go hand in hand in many patients. Uh, in terms of the risk of forming clots inside the heart and those clots moving to the brain and giving you a stroke, I want you to think about atrial flutter in a similar way to atrial fibrillation. So for these patients, you will also try and document the CHATS VAS score to calculate what the risk of stroke is. And if they have a CHATS VAS score of more than two and they are males, you're gonna initiate anticoagulation. And if they are females and they have a CHATS VAS score three or more, you will also initiate anticoagulation to prevent clots from forming inside the heart. This arrhythmia is a macro reentrant circuit. That means that the electrical short circuit is a big circuit that goes all around the, the right atrium. As you can see here, this is a picture of the right atrium, uh, looking at it from the front. And the circuit goes all around from the free wall of the right atrium to the floor towards the tricuspid valve up the interatrial septum. And I wanted to remember that so you understand the basic of the treatment when we do catheter ablation. Now, atrial flutter is very difficult to ray control as opposed to atrial fibrillation. So you can attempt, attempt to ray control the patient acutely while you temporize things and you decide what to do long term. But for atrial flutter, catheter ablation is considered curative. That is 99% of the times that we do a catheter ablation in these patients, the patients are free from atrial flutter lifelong. Whereas in atrial fibrillation, that number, that efficacy rate is around 70 to 85%, depending on the patient and the type of atrial fibrillation. So catheter ablation for atrial flutter is considered uh, a curative intervention, curative intervention. If they are unstable, that is if they're hypotensive or the patient's going to heart failure, I want you to always consider uh, emergent or urgent cardioversion to restore sinus rhythm with a very quick and non-invasive treatment. So that concludes the section of atrial flutter. And now I'm gonna talk about uh, other supraventricular arrhythmias, which we uh, typically group as a classic, classic SVTs. Atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation are also supraventricular because they come from the atrium, but they are easier to identify because flutter has classic F waves and atrial fibrillation is a very irregular, or as we say in electrophysiology, irregularly irregular uh, tachycardia. So they are very easy to identify on EKG. The SVTs can be a little bit more tricky to identify. And the classic SVTs that we include are atrial tachycardias, 
AV nodal tachycardias, that is AV and RT, which I mentioned at the beginning, and then tachycardias like AVRT that are dependent both on the AV node and on an accessory pathway, uh, which is a classic substrate for patients with Wolf, Parkinson, White, or WPW. So let's talk briefly about these three. The uh, most common one of these three is clearly AVNRT, AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. And the classic finding is a very rapid tachycardia with a very narrow, very skinny QRS, as you can see uh, on the top EKG. And the other classic finding is that there's a little P wave that is hiding typically at the end of the QRS. And that's why we call it uh, or we englobe these tachycardias in the group of short RP tachycardias, meaning that the interval between the R wave of the QRS and the retrograde P wave is really, really short, okay? If you don't remember short RP or long RP, I don't mind, but I really want you to remember that all SVTs are narrow QRS and they tend to be regular, okay? Some of them have short RP and some of them have long RP, but I don't wanna to talk too much about that because uh, that will take too much time. Uh, and I think it goes beyond the scope of this uh, limited lecture. Now, just, just to throw this out there and uh, so you understand why we do this, the measuring the RP interval allows us to distinguish AV and RT orthodromic AVRT, which I'll talk about it later, and atrial tachycardias in two different groups, okay? So classically, atrial tachycardia is a long RP tachycardia, and AVNRT and AVRT are short RP tachycardias, and that's why we use that interval to separate and distinguish one from the other. Now, in AV nodal reentrant tachycardia, what happens is that in 10% of the population, the AV node has a fast pathway, which is the one that we all have. We, all are, we are all born with a fast pathway, but 10% of the population has a slow pathway. So what happens is that when you have this substrate, you have a perfect substrate for a, an electrical short circuit within the AV node within the AV node. So what happens is that you go down the slow pathway and you go up the fast pathway and that short circuit perpetrates and that initiates the tachycardia. And I want you to remember the slow pathway as an important substrate for this arrhythmia. Since you go down the slow pathway and you go up the fast pathway, what that generates is a very short RP. So you depolarize the ventricle and then you go up the fast pathway and you go so quickly back up to the atrium that that gives you a little P wave right there at the end of the QRS, okay? For uh, AVNRT, you can also use vagal maneuvers, calcium blockers and beta blockers to slow down the AV node those are typically temporary measures. They can break the tachycardia, but they will not fix the problem because I told you at the beginning of this section that the substrate for these patients is the presence of a slow pathway. And physiologically, the slow pathway is not needed for the normal heart function. So the rationale for the treatment which is catheter ablation in the vast majority of the patients is to actually cauterize, burn this area, which is typically an area of one millimeter or two and is located just below the fast pathway. The distance between the fast and the slow pathway is variable, but with the current tools that we have, we are able to burn this area, cauterize this area, even when it's only a few millimeters apart from the fast pathway without causing damage to the really important structure, uh, which is the fast pathway of the AV node. Let's talk briefly about Wolf Parkinson White and what we call AVRT, AV reciprocating tachycardias. 
that's a tachycardia that will go down most commonly down the AV node and will use an accessory connection between the ventricle and the atrium, which we call an accessory pathway to go back from the ventricle into the atrium. So you will go down the AV node and you're gonna use a different road to go back into the atrium, which is this accessory pathway, which is an anomaly. Most of us don't have accessory pathways, but some people are born with an accessory pathway and those patients that have the accessory pathway, we call that on the EKG, WPW or Worf Parkinson white pattern. If you have the pathway and you also have tachycardia, that qualifies as Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. So in order for you to have the Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, you need to have the pathway, but you also need to have tachycardias. And the classic finding, the classic finding of WPW on EKG is this slurring, this slowing in the depolarization on the upstroke of that R wave that you can clearly see here. You can clearly see it here in V1. You can clearly see it here in V4. That slurring is called the delta wave, delta wave. And when you have this type of slurring on the QRS, that's suggestive that you have an accessory pathway. Now, that slurring is caused by the fact that you're depolarizing the ventricle using two different roads. You use the AV node and you use the accessory pathway. And the accessory pathway conducts electricity very slowly. So that gives you that little slurring that you see at the beginning of the QRS. Now that's assuming that the pathway is able to conduct down into the ventricle, but there are some pathways that don't have the ability to conduct to the ventricle and we call those concealed pathways. So the fact that you don't have a delta wave doesn't mean that you don't have a pathway because you can have a concealed accessory connection that instead of conducting down uh, from the atrium down into the ventricle, it only conducts retrogradely from the ventricle into the atrium. And once again, we call those concealed and they don't have a delta wave on the EKG, okay? So that's a big difference between a manifest accessory pathway and a concealed accessory pathway. One has EKG manifestations and the other one doesn't, but both have the ability to produce AVRT, which is the most common arrhythmia seen in patients with WPW. So we use a the term orthodromic for the most common arrhythmia, which is going, the most common circuit, which is going down the AV node and going up the accessory pathway. And we call antidromic when you go down the accessory pathway from the atrium into the ventricle and you go up the AV node. Antidromic is much less common than orthodromic. Now, orthodromic, which is the most common, you can see that actually looks fairly similar on the EKG than AVNRT. It's a very narrow QRS, it's very fast, and it's regular. Antidromic, antidromic is actually a wide complex tachycardia as opposed to orthodromic, which is a narrow complex tachycardia. Okay, that's a big difference between one and the other. But if you remember just the orthodromic AVRT, I would be happy because that's the most the one that we see most commonly. This one represents represents only probably ten percent of the cases that we see. So how do we handle these patients with anti uh, with um, uh, pre excitation? So one of the things that I want you to remember is that a patient that comes with a pre-excited tachycardia, that is a tachycardia that is using an accessory pathway, and you have some knowledge that the patient has WPW from older EKGs, I want you to remember that the drugs of choice for these patients are IV procainamide, an antiarrhythmic, uh, 
or IV amiodarone. For the other uh, SVTs that we discussed, we typically use beta blockers, calcium blockers, adenosine, and all those drugs slow down AV nodal conduction. But for WPW, the recommendation is to use these IV agents when you want to use drugs to control the arrhythmia. So that concludes the section of SVTs. And we talked about, we covered a lot of ground. Uh, these are usually 10 chapters in any electrophysiology book. So I'm sure you will have a lot of questions, but we will have a chance to talk a little bit more when we open it for discussion. So now let's move to the second part of the lecture, which is the description and analysis of ventricular tachycardias. Like the name uh, suggests, these tachycardias are also electrical short circuits, but instead of originating in the atrium, in the AV node, or using accessory pathways, these typically originate from the ventricular myocardium. There are some rare forms that originate from the papillary muscles, um, from the tendons in the ventricle, but most of them originate within the ventricular myocardium. And if you're gonna remember just one thing about the ventricular tachycardias, I want you to remember this. That is really important to separate the two groups of patients that have a structurally normal heart, that is those patients that you do an echocardiogram and they have normal structure and function, that you are sure that they don't have any obstructive coronary disease. And once you rule that out, then you can put those patients within the group of structurally normal hearts. If you find any abnormality, that is an abnormal echocardium with abnormal myocardial function, or coronary disease in these patients, this is a completely different group. And what distinguishes these two groups is that patients with a structurally normal heart that present with ventricular tachycardia do not have increased risk of sudden cardiac death, okay? Whereas patients with cardiomyopathies and coronary disease that develop ventricular tachycardia, they do have a significant increase in the risk of sudden cardiac death. So if you're gonna remember just one thing, I want you to remember these two uh, uh, classifications because it really has implications for the patient, the family, and obviously for the type of treatments that we're gonna offer to these uh, two groups of patients. So we call ventricular tachycardia when you see three or more consecutive beats on an EKG that are Y complex. Whereas in SVTs, we discuss that in the vast majority of them, the QRSs are narrow. In ventricular tachycardia, the QRSs are wide. And if you have three in a row, more than three in a row, we call that ventricular tachycardia. Now, if they only last between three beats and less than 30 seconds, we call them non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. And if you have white complex QRSs that go beyond 30 seconds in duration without interruption, we call that sustained ventricular tachycardia. Okay, so these are the classic terms and definitions that we use when we are talking about these patients. The presentation, uh, is, is very, the spectrum of the presentation is really wide. Surprisingly, there's you know, a small fraction of patients that can be asymptomatic, but most patients present with palpitations, dyspnea, or even a syncopal event. And obviously the most drastic presentation is those patients that have uh, uh, sudden cardiac death and that they hopefully survive the cardiac arrest they were successfully resuscitated and they are brought to the hospital. I'm gonna skip this slide because I think for, the, for this type of audience, uh, it's a little bit too complex, but we have algorithms, algorithms to distinguish between 
ventricular tachycardia and supraventricular tachycardias that have a YQRS. But for this level of talk, I want you to remember that SVTs have a narrow complex, uh, are narrow complex tachycardia that is a narrow QRS tachycardia and that VTs, ventricular tachycardias for the most part, have a YQRS. And if you remember that, I'll be happy. Now, as a general concept, if you're encounter with a patient that has a Y complex tachycardia, I want you to think that this is ventricular tachycardia until proven otherwise. Why? Because you don't want to miss patients that have a structurally abnormal heart with VT and miss the opportunity to treat them and to assess the risk of sudden cardiac death. So a Y complex tachycardia is VT until proven otherwise. In unselected patients, the vast majority, more than 80% are VT. In patients with heart disease, you know that this patient had a heart attack, you know that this patient had congestive heart failure, and now they present with white complex tachycardia, 95% of more of these rhythms will be VT. So you don't have to worry about determining whether it's truly VT or SVT because the statistics are in your favor. Most patients with VT actually will have a significant impact on blood pressure. They will have some degree of hypertension, uh, hypotension, I'm sorry. They will be hypotensive or they will have a significant change from their baseline. So if they're hypertensive, they will be uh, normal tensive. But the fact that you have a normal blood pressure and you have a white complex tachycardia that doesn't mean that you cannot have VT. That doesn't mean that the white complex tachycardia is not ventricular tachycardia. If the patient is unstable, this is true for any electrical abnormality in the heart, whether it's SVT or VT. If the patient is unstable, the treatment is always cardioversion, okay? You put a patch, if you have low pressure room, you give a little bit of sedation, and you shock these patients out of the arrhythmia. I would ask you to uh, stay away for, uh, from IV verapamil because it causes hypotension and uh, it should only be used in a highly monitored setting like the uh, electrophysiology lab where we do our procedures. Now, we discussed at the beginning of the talk that it's really important that you make the distinction between structurally uh, normal hearts versus patients with structural heart disease. Ischemic cardiomyopathy are those that have coronary disease or had a myocardial infarction. Non-ischemics are those that don't have coronary disease. There are some congenital syndromes that we'll talk at the end, including right ventricular dysplasia and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the number one cause of sudden death in competitive athletes. And then you have a large group of patients that actually have no structural heart disease. And importantly, and you will remember this, they do not have increased risk of sudden death. So these are patients, this group with a normal heart, these are patients that typically present with the most common ventricular tachycardia, which we call the outflow tract tachycardias. These are tachycardias that come from the right ventricular outflow tract. That's an area that encompasses the uh, last part that communicates the right ventricle with the pulmonary artery or the left ventricle with the ascending aorta. And in the myocardium of that area, we encounter all these tachycardias called outflow tract VTs. And the good news is that they uh, are very responsive to catheter ablation, so we can actually cure these patients. Acutely, we use beta blockers, calcium blockers, but long-term, we can really cure these patients from these arrhythmias. The mechanism are usually small short circuits uh, within an area of scar or within an area of abnormal myocardium. And they are very frequent uh, in patients with a normal heart that recently had a myocardial infarction. In the case, um, in the case of patients with abnormal heart, uh, 
it's very important to identify whether they have any obstructive coronary disease and relieve the obstruction if they have any. And these are the patients that long-term we're gonna consider the implantation of a device called ICD or intracardiac defibrillator. Why? Because if they have one episode, they have high risk of having a recurrent episode that can result in a full cardiac arrest. Beta blockers and ACE inhibitors are associated with improved survival in many of these patients with a structurally abnormal heart that present with VT. So you're gonna see this regimen of beta blockers and ACE inhibitors in most of these patients that present with abnormal hearts. Now, in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is the number one cause of sudden cardiac death in younger patients, uh, that have a structurally abnormal heart. They typically present with syncope initially, typically occurs during or right after exercise. They have a strong family history. Uh, so it's really important that in these patients, you get a detailed family history to understand if there's any uh, report of a young family member with syncope or, or with death at a, at a young, age without a clear source. And they typically have a very thick ventricle. And the ones that present with ventricular tachycardia or cardiac arrest, they typically have walls that are thicker than three centimeters. When you monitor these patients, you're gonna find a lot of small runs of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. And in most patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that present with VT or ventricular fibrillation or with a cardiac arrest, unless there's a contraindication, in these patients, we will always recommend implanting an intracardiac defibrillator. Let's talk briefly about ARVD or arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. We like the term nowadays ARVC for arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy because what we found, as you can see on the cardiac MRI here at the bottom right of the slide, is that the right ventricle of this patient is really bright when we look at them in cardiac MRI. And that's because they have infiltration of fat and scar typically at the free wall of the right ventricle. And that area of scar and fat, what it does is allows for uh, an area of slow conduction to serve as a perfect substrate for an electrical short circuit to build up in that area and result in a white complex tachycardia that in most of these patients, 99% of the time is ventricular tachycardia, okay? Uh, it's difficult to see this wave on their baseline EKG, but if you find this little notch at the end of the QRS, which we call the epsilon wave, that's a hallmark on the 12-bit EKG for this type of cardiomyopathies uh, englobed as ARVC or ARVD, okay? So you're gonna have fat in the RV, scar in the RV, and an epsilon wave on the baseline EKG when the patient is in normal sinus rhythm. Now let's talk about the most interesting and most common actually ventricular tachycardia. And those are the patients that have normal hearts. Not infrequently, we get a medical student uh, that had a fainting episode in medical school and we find that the patient had uh, ventricular tachycardia. We do all the studies and the echocardia and the cardiac MRI is all normal and the student ends up having outflow tract ventricular tachycardia. Most of them come from the right side, from the right ventricular outflow tract, and around 15, 20% come from the left ventricular outflow tract or from the aortic cusps. I'm not gonna talk about fascicular VT today uh, because that's a whole other chapter. Most of them come from this area. Uh, uh, the area of the right ventricle uh, uh, extending all the way into the pulmonic valve. And a small fraction come from this area uh, 
the LVOT all the way up into the ascending aorta. In patients that have no structural heart disease, if you have enough ventricular tachycardia, that can result actually in dysfunction of the myocardium to the point that the pumping function, the ejection fraction is reduced. But the good news is that when you treat this arrhythmia, the systolic function, the myocardiac function restores. So we typically treat these patients with catheter ablation because they tend to be younger patients and you don't, you don't wanna commit these patients to take lifelong beta blockers or calcium blockers or antiarrhythmic drugs. And the efficacy rate for catheter ablation for these types of uh, patients is in excess of 90%. So uh, a very effective therapy. This is just to show you an example of what we do. We bring these patients to the lab and we measure the electrical activity in that area. And we create sort of like a GPS map that tells us using different colors uh, and uh, color coding the electrical activity where the earliest electrical activity is. The red area is the earliest electrical activation and that's the area where the arrhythmia is coming from. So then we go back to this area, we cauterize and burn that area, and that eliminates the tachycardia in more than 90% of the patients. Let's talk about the last section of this talk, uh, about genetic syndromes. That includes patients with congenital long QT. So they, they have a problem with a repolarization of the myocardium, and that creates a prolonged QT interval. Patients with Brugada syndrome, these are patients that typically have a mutation in their sodium channel. So they have a problem in the depolarization. Long QT is a problem in the repolarization. And we already talked about uh, patients with arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, which is also considered a genetic syndrome because there's a mutation that has been described in most of these patients. Now, uh, some of these patients, particularly the ones with long QT, can present with what we call polymorphic tachycardia, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. That is, the QRSs are wide, but they are different from one another, as opposed to the other tachycardias that we talked, that they are wide, but all the QRSs are fairly similar. In most of these cases, there's some trigger. For example, they have electrolyte abnormalities, they uh, have low potassium, low magnesium, low calcium, or they are taking another drug that prolongs their QT interval. For example, fluoroquinolones like uh, levofloxacin is a very common agent. And then uh, antipsychotics are another common group of drugs that can prolong the QT and result in this uh, form of ventricular tachycardia called polymorphic ventricular tachycardia or torsades de points. And the initial treatment for these patients with polymorphic VT should include intravenous magnesium. And they also respond to uh, lidocaine IV or mexilitin PO. We don't use phenytoin here in the US. For these patients, there's really no role for uh, ablation. And most of these patients will require an ICD because the risk of a recurrent episode is very, very high. And it's very important to uh, include somebody with experience in genetic counseling because uh, since they are inherited uh, genetic abnormalities, it's very important to do a thorough family history and adequate counseling for their first degree relatives. Uh, we discussed that polymorphic VT can be associated with electrolyte abnormalities, and it's not uncommon for patients that have acute ischemia, that is an acute occlusion of one of the coronary arteries, to also develop some of these polymorphic VTs. Let's talk lastly about the Brugada syndrome. As opposed to long QT syndrome, which is a deep a repolarization problem, Brugada syndrome has a problem with a sodium channel that produces an abnormality at the end of the QRS and at the beginning of the repolarization phase uh, 
that gives you this classic uh, saddle configuration in V1 and V2. And I hope you can see the abnormality here uh, at the end of the QRS with that big R prime and a very slow descent both in V1 and V2. And that's a classic description by the Brugada brothers in 1992. Uh, it's associated with a uh, mutation as a loss of function of the sodium channel associated with this particular gene that can be tested. So if you find this and the patient has symptoms of syncope or tachycardia, it's really, really important to do a thorough family history so you can study genetically their first degree relatives. Most patients that have uh, Brugada syndrome, that is that have that pattern on the EKG and they have symptoms, will have some form of cardiac arrest, aborted or full-blown cardiac arrest, syncopal events. And uh, the role of putting ICDs, intracardiac defibrillators, in patients that just have the EKG but don't have syncope and don't have cardiac arrest is still controversial. And the role of the EP study in this patient remains an area of debate uh, in our field. We spoke about a lot of different things, very complex uh, arrhythmias, very different types of arrhythmias. I tried to give, to give you the basics on each one of them and highlight the most relevant clinical points. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'm gonna open now the session for questions and answers. Thank you so much, Dr. Vilas Gonzalez. What a phenomenal presentation. I know that the students appreciate you tremendously. And those of um, already have specialized uh, will understand exactly what the challenges are in determining which type of arrhythmia is which and how to treat it. The, there, are, um, there are certain conditions that uh, we tend to see more uh, here in the United States um, than uh, anywhere else and probably is because of the diagnostics and the way we actually look for um, patient symptoms in order for us to diagnose. If I was to ask you which uh, is the most frequent of the conditions that you see at uh, MCVI, Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute, which would that be? So uh, the, be, I, the reason why I put atrial fibrillation at the beginning of the talk is because there's not a single day in my life that I don't see a patient with atrial fibrillation. Every day at, I see at least one or two patients that have new diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. And that is a function, unfortunately, of a very unhealthy lifestyle that we have nowadays in, in all the occidental part of the world. Uh, that includes obesity, metabolic syndrome, hypertension, diabetes, obstructive sleep apnea, which are all well-known risk factors for this uh, uh, very, very common arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation. Mm -hmm. Definitely, um, it, that is why we have such emphasis on prevention and, and trying to at least address the public health issues in order for us to prevent conditions such as this and other more severe ones. Uh, we have one of the students, her name is Julissa. I don't know what country she is from, but she, I guess we need to clarify something for her. It says, but um, if, if we do not change uh, the sinus rhythm, isn't there a risk for embolism? Or if we change the sinus rhythm, wouldn't that be counterproductive? It's a really, really good question. So uh, that reminds me to highlight the difference between atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation from the rest of the SVTs that we discussed today. The only two SVTs that increase the risk of forming a clot inside the heart and therefore giving you a stroke are just atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation. The, the risk of dislodging that clot that is already formed inside the heart, as a student pointed out, is higher at the time that you do a cardioversion. But the stroke risk long-term is not dictated 
by whether the patient is in atrial fibrillation or is in normal rhythm. The stroke risk is determined by the CHATS VAS score that I described at the beginning of the talk. So if a patient has atrial fibrillation, we restore normal sinus rhythm, but the CHATS VAS score, let's say, is six, the stroke risk is still very high. So it's really important that despite the fact that that patient is back in normal rhythm, you continue anticoagulation uh, lifelong, regardless of whether the patient is in sinus rhythm or is in atrial fibrillation. For atrial flutter, it's slightly different because I mentioned that the success rate of catheter ablation is so high that we can actually cure these patients. So what we typically do is we give them anticoagulation before the ablation. So we ensure that we dissolve any clots before the ablation or before the cardioversion. And then we give them anticoagulation for another four weeks after the cardioversion and the ablation, and that's it. But that's a big difference between flutter and atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is not considered a curable disease and therefore to establish the long-term risk of stroke, you have to use a chat vas score. Hmm. How interesting. Um, the, um, I know that uh, Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute is, uh, has, uh, with Dr. Katzen, has been always innovative. If, if you were to tell us um, what you're most excited about for the future of treatment in arrhythmias, uh, what, what can you share with us? So I think, um, you know, electrophysiology is a relatively new field. And it's, you know, it's so new, really take, uh, we're talking about, you know, a field that is only like 25 years old, which for medicine is very, very young. So I would say that every year we have uh, small or big steps uh, in terms of upgrades and innovation in the tools that we use to perform catheter ablation uh, to the point that uh, in the past we had to use radiation, we had to use x-ray to see these catheters and now we can even do ablations in pregnant patients without the use of fluoroscopy, without the use of x-ray and I think that has been really the major uh, step forward in, in my field, the fact that we can do these procedures with minimal use of fluoroscopy or in extreme cases like a pregnant woman uh, without fluoroscopy at all. That is remarkable. Uh, we have a few minutes, uh, but I want to read um, a, a comment here. And uh, the first uh, student is from Peru, by the way. But I have one from Gustavo Alvarez, a student doctor from U.S. School of Medicine in Ecuador. And his question is, in an obese patient with permanent atrial fibrillation, if he decides to lose weight, does it increase the possibility of controlling the rhythms? It's a really good question. What we learned is that there's no causal, direct uh, causal relationship between obesity, sleep apnea, diabetes, and hypertension, and atrial fibrillation. What we did learn is that regardless of the treatment choice that you pick, whether it's antiarrhythmic drugs, whether it's ablation, whether it's rate control, the patients that lose weight, the patients that control their blood pressure and diabetes, have a significantly much better quality of life and have a significantly less uh, uh, chance of having a recurrent episode of atrial fibrillation. So it will not eliminate the arrhythmia, but it will significantly increase their quality of life and decrease the risk of a recurrent event. Very well. Uh, Fernando Ramirez is wondering, what are the risk or complications of cardiac ablation regarding radiation? So uh, for the, uh, the overall cardiac ablation is a very safe procedure. You know, we divide the procedures in cardiology in high, intermediate, and low risk. And uh, for the different types of ablations for SVT, AFib, flutter, and VT, the risk of complication is slightly different, but they are all less than 3% or less than 3% complication rate. 
and therefore we consider them a low risk procedure. Now for the SVTs, for the simple procedures like SVT ablation, uh, WPW ablation, atrial flutter ablation, the complication rate is even below 1%. So the risk of having a problem in those cases is really, really small. And in the more simple ablations, we only use typically 60 seconds, 90 seconds of fluoroscopy to complete the entire procedure. For the more complex procedures, we can use anywhere between three to 10 minutes of fluoroscopy. Unfortunately, time is uh, running and uh, we wanna be considerate to you, doctor. Uh, what a phenomenal presentation. And we would like to thank you on behalf of Baptist Health International I would like to thank you and all the participants today uh, for attending this phenomenal lecture. If you have additional questions for Dr. Vilas Gonzalez and about his presentation, please feel free to email us at internationalbaptisthealth.net. We will be more than happy to forward your questions and responses. Um, Dr. Hakim, I also, uh, if, if you look on the chat, I also, I also included my Baptist email on the chat in case somebody wants to ask me a question afterwards. Very kind of you. Please take advantage, especially uh, now that uh, if you are in cardiology, if you're taking cardiology and you would like to ask a question directly to the specialist, please do so. Uh, or also at internationalbaptisthealth.net. In any event, we look forward to seeing you at our next monthly medical lecture, which is scheduled for Wednesday, October 14, 2020. The speaker will be Dr. Roy Cardoso from the Orthopedic Surgeon Department, Surgery Department at Miami Orthopedic and Sports Medicine Institute. Thank you again. Please be safe, mask up, and we'll see you soon. Thank you and have a